Κυρίες και κύριοι, καλημέρα σας. Ε, καλώς ήρθατε στη γιορτή μας για το Μεγάλο Βάρδο. Εγώ είμαι ο μονοπρόσωπος χορός. Είμαι και χορός και μαέστρος και πρόλογος και επίλογος. Γιορτάζουμε τα 400 χρόνια από το θάνατο του Σέξπι. Ε, είπα θάνατο, εννοούσα την αρχή της μεταθανάτιας ζωής του. Η πρώτη σκηνή που θα δείτε εκτιλήσεται το έτος 1623 σε ένα τυπογραφείο. Ναι, πολύ καλά ακούσατε το, 1623. Γιατί τότε οι φίλοι του Σέξπιρ δημοσίευσαν για πρώτη φορά όλα ή σχεδόν όλα τα έργα τους σε έναν εντυπωσιακό τόμο που ονομάζεται The First Folio. Τη συνέχεια όμως θα την ακούσετε στα αγγλικά για να σας βάλουμε λίγο στο πνεύμα και για να ξεσκονίσουμε και τα αγγλικά σας. Where the task it was, I'm glad we've done. Oh. Gathering wheels, scattered place together, solving all the quarters. What a mess they were in. Many of his plays were quite made. I hope the piracies will stop now. Good morrow to you both. Is it done? Here it is. Oh, what an impressive folio. Let me see my preface. <clears throat> to the memory of my beloved, the author Mr. William Shakespeare and what he hath left us. And though thou hadst no Latin and less Greek, From thence to honor thee, I would not seek for names, but call forth thundering Schilus, that's Aeschylus, Euripides and Sophocles to us, but Cuvius, Archius, him of God of a dead, to life again, to hear thy basking tread and sick stage. Or, when thy socks were on, leave thee alone for the comparison of all that insolent Greece or haughty Rome sent forth, or since dead from their ashes come. Triumph, my Britain, thou hast one to show, to whom all sins of Europe homage owe. He was not of an age, but for all time. Is it not a splendid eulogy, my friends? Then, is this a praise or a, or a dispraise? Though thou hast small Latin and less Greek, what means thou? <laughs> the truth of it is, Henry, he did not speak Greek at all. Just a few words he had learned from Tully's book. I'd put Euripides in front of him. He'd look at the lines intently, then raise his blank eyes, and like his casca in Julius Caesar say, it's all Greek to me. <laughs> I helped him, you know, I have a big library. God bless you. But is a man not a poet, except he be versed in Greek. Thou art a good man, Henry. Oh, when I'm gone, I wish there'd be such good men as you to make as handsome a book of my plays and poems as this is. Sir, hearing that the new folio came out with all the plays of our beloved William Shakespeare, a group of itinerant players have arrived outside and are craving leave to perform scenes from his plays. They are welcome. Let them in. We shall perform a miscellany of scenes, what the French call potpourri. The boys of St. Paul's are here to do the women's parts. But theatrically speaking, it's mostly a bunch of girls from the English department here to do the men's parts. Lord, how the times have turned topsy-turvy. Master Shakespeare would smile in his grave to see so many Rosalindas mounting the stage in trousers. And now, ladies and gentlemen, follow us into the Bard's universe. A universe not only of kings and heroes, but also simple people, sometimes even unforgettable facts. We will begin with a scene from the history of King Henry IV, part one. The scene you are about to watch takes place in the Boar's Head, a London tavern in the neighborhood of Vichy that harbors vagabonds, drunkards, pickpockets, and some nicer people. The most famous customer of the tavern is Sir John Falstaff, a fat and lazy old man who loves to drink ale and brag about his valor. Falstaff is a great liar, an inventor of lies. You will see him shortly argue with Prince Hal, the king's prodigal son and heir to the throne. Mark the joke that Hal and the others have played on Falstaff. Here they come. Dost thou hear me, Hal? Aye, and mark thee too, Jack. Do so, for it is where the listening to. This is nine in Papion that I told you of. So two more already. Their points being broken. Down fell their hose. Began to give me ground. But I followed me close, carrying foot and hand. And with a thought, 
Seven of the eleven I paid. Oh, monsters! Eleven Bakra men grown out of two. But as the devil would have it, three misbegotten names gave on my back and let drive at me. For it was so dark hull that the could not see thy hand. These lies are like their father that begets them. Gross as a mountain, open, palpable. Why thou clean brain guts, thou naughty parted fool, thou portion of sea, greasy tallow catch? What art thou mad, art thou mad? Is not the truth the truth? Why, how couldst thou know this man in Kendall Green when it was so dark thou couldst not see thy hand? Come, tell us your reason. What says that to this? Come, Jack, your reason. What? Upon compulsion? Zunes and I were at this trapad, or all the racks in the west, I would not tell you on compassion. Give you a reason on compassion? If reasons were as plentiful as blackberries, I would give no man a reason upon compassion I. I'll be no longer guilty of this thing, this sanguine coward, this bed presser, this horseback breaker, this huge heel of flesh. Splat! You stubbling, you asking, you dry bleach stung, you push pizzle. Awful breath to utter what is like you. You tailor's yard, you shit, you bogus, you vile standing tug. Well, breathe a while and then treat again. And when thou hast dared thyself in base comparison, hear me speak but this. Mark Jack. We two, so you four, set on four and bound them and were masters of their wealth. Mark now how a clay tail shall put you down. Then did we two set on you for and with a word outfaced you from your present habit, yeah, and can show it you here in the house. And false stuff? You carried your guts away as nimbly and with as quick dexterity and wrought for mercy and still run and roar as ever I had book up. What a slave art thou to cut thy sword that thou hast done and then say it was in a fight? What trick, what device, what starting hole canst thou now find out to hide thee from the sober and apparent shame? Come, let's hear, Jack. What trick hast thou now? By the Lord, I knew ye as well as he that made me. Why hear you, my masters? Was it for me to kill the heir apparent? Should I turn upon the true prince? Why? Thou knowest I am as valiant as Hercules. But beware instinct. The lion will not touch the true prince. Instinct is a great matter. I was now a coward on instinct. I shall think the better of myself and thee during my life. I for a valiant lion and thou for a true prince. But by the Lord lads, I am glad you have the money. Hostess, clap to the doors. Watch tonight, pray tomorrow. Gallant lads, boys, hearts of gold, all the titles of good fellowship happen to you. What? Shall we be married? Shall we have a play extempore? <laughs> Content, and the argument shall be thy running I away. No more of that, Helen, thou lovest me. We will now take it to a scene from the history of King Henry V. In this simple play, Hal is no longer the playmate of Falstaff and his likes, but the King of England. As a young king, Henry is just and humane, but also formidable. The scene you are about to watch takes place in France, after the famous Battle of Agincourt, where the brave English defeated the French, even though they were outnumbered five to one by them. The victorious Henry claims all. In the peace negotiations, Henry has asked for rule over France and for the hand of the French Princess Catherine, who is part of the bargain. But Henry has not forgotten his sense of humor from his youthful days, nor his strategy among his troops. As in war, so in love, he wants the consent of his subject. He will woo Catherine, not take her by force. However, there is a little problem. He speaks little French, and she even less English. As you will see, they are hilariously lost in translation. Here they come. Is it possible that I should love the enemy of France? No. It is not possible you should love the enemy of France, Kate. But in loving me, you should love the friend of France. For I love France so well that I will not part with the village of it. I will have it all mine. And Kate, when France is mine and I'm yours, then yours is France and you're mine. I cannot tell what is that. 
No, Kate? I will tell thee in French. Which I'm sure will hang upon my tongue like a new married wife about a husband's neck, hardly to be shook off. <clears throat> uh, je compte sur les uh, possessions de, de France. Uh, uh, vous avez uh, sur les possessions de, de moi. Uh, then Saint Denis be my speed. Uh, dans votre uh, Fran France, vous êtes mien. It is as easy for me to conquer the kingdom as it is to speak so much more French. <laughs> I, shall never, I shall never move in French unless it be to laugh at me. No, faith is not, Kate. But thy speaking of my tongue and I thine, most truly falsely, must needs be granted to be much of one. But dost thou understand thus much English? Canst thou love me? I cannot tell. Can any of your neighbors tell, Kate? I'll ask them. Come, I know thou lovest me. And at night, when you come into your closet, you question this gentle woman about me. And I know, Kate, you will to her dispraise those parts in me that you love with your heart. But good Kate, mock me mercifully. There are other gentle princes because I love thee cruelly. If ever thou beest mine, as I have a saving faith within me tells me thou shalt, I get thee with scrambling, and thou must therefore needs prove a good soldier breeder. Shall not thou and I, between St. Denis and St. George, compound a boy, half English, half French, that shall go to Constantinople and take the Turk by the beard? <laughs> what sayest thou? Shall we not? What sayest thou, my fair Fleur de Luz? I do not know that. No, tis hereafter to know, but now to promise. Do but now promise, Kate, you will endeavor for your French part of such a boy. And for my English moiety, take the word of a king and a bachelor. How answer you, la plus belle Catherine du monde, mon dresse de vindes? Come your answer in broken music. For thy voice is music, and thy English broken. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, Queen of all, Catherine, break thy mind to me in broken English. Will thou have me? That is as it shall please the roi mon père. Hey, it will please him, Kate. It shall please him, Kate. Then it shall also content me. Upon that, I kiss your hand and I call you my queen. Laissez, Monseigneur, laissez, laissez. Ma foi, je ne veux pas que vous abaissiez votre grandeur en baissant la main d'une de votre Seigneur et de vos serviteurs. Excusez-moi, je vous supplie, mon très puissant Seigneur. Then I will kiss your lips, Kate. Oh, oui, les dames des voisines de France, des Vanglais, ils pourraient être baissés des Vanglais, non, qu'il n'est pas à l'habitude de France. Madame, my interpreter, what says she? That it is not the fashion for maids in France to kiss before they are married. We are the makers of manners, Kate, and the liberty that follows our places stops the mouth of fine faults, as I will stop yours. <laughs> famous Shakespearean character who is the complete opposite, indecisive, self-doubting and anti-heroic. As you may have guessed, this is Hamlet, Prince of Denmark and a university student like many of you. Hamlet is a conscientious Christian and a perceptive young man who sees the corruption in Denmark but fails to act because he has philosophical issues to solve. We will not give you his famous to be or not to be monologue, sorry to disappoint your expectations. Instead, we will offer you a literally down-to-earth scene that involves a witty grave digger in conversation with Prince Hamlet. Who better than a grave digger to talk about death? Who better than Hamlet to philosophize on the topic? Here they come. Sarah? Mine. 
lines, eh? <laughs> oh, a bit of clay for to be made for such a guest as me. I think it be thine indeed for the lie stint. And you lie out on it, sir. Therefore, it is not yours. For my part, I do not lie in it. And yet it is mine. Thou dost lie in to be entertained as thine. This for the dead, not for the quick. Therefore, thou liest. Tis a quick lie, sir. Quail away again from me to you. What man dost thou dig it for? For no man, sir. What woman, then? For none, neither. Who is to be buried in it? One that was a woman, sir, but to rest your soul, she's dead. Now, absolute the knaves, we must speak by the card, or equivocation will undo us. By the Lord, Horatio, these three years I have taken note of it. The age is grown so thick that the toe of the peasant comes so near the hill of the courtier, he carves his kibe. How long hast thou been a grave maker? Of all the days in the year, I came to it that day that our last in Hamlet overcame fourteen brass. How long is that since? Cannot you tell that? Every fool can tell that. It was the very day that young Hamlet was born. He that was mad and sent into England. Hey Mary, why was he sent into England? Why, because he was mad. He shall recover his wits there. And if he do not, it is no great matter there. Why? It will not be seen in him there. There the men are as mad as he. <laughs> How came he mad? Very strangely, they say. How strangely? Ian was losing his wits. Upon what ground? Why, here in Denmark. <laughs> I have been sexton here, man and boy, for thirty years. How long will a man lie the earth as he rot? If he be not rotten before he die, as you have many pocky corpses uh, nowadays that will scarce hold the laying in, he will last you some eight years or nine years. A tanner will last you nine years. Why he more than another? Why, sir, his type, his hair, hide is so done with his trade that he will keep out water a great while, and your water is a sore decay of your horse and dead body. Here's a skull now. This skull has been lying in the earth for three and twenty years. Whose was it? A horse and mad fellow it was. Whose do you think it was? Nay, I know not. A pestilence on him for a mad rogue. He had pulled a flagon of rainies on my head once. The same skull, sir, is Yorick's skull, the king's jester. This. And that. Let me see. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio. A fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times. And now how bored in my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. Here hang those lips that I have kissed, I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now? Your gambols, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roll. Not one now to mark your own grinning. Quite shot falling. Now, now I'll get you to my lady's chamber and tell her. Let her paint an inch think to me to this favour she must come. Make her laugh at that. Prithee, Horatio, tell me one thing. What's that, my lord? Dost thou think Alexander looked all this fashion in the earth? Even so. And smelt so? Oh. Even so, my lord. To what base uses we may return, Horatio? May not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander, that he find it serping a bunghole? For to consider too curiously, to consider so. Now some experiences are so vibrant and so outlandish that we lose hold of them. We cannot without rational thought determine whether they're real or not. This is what happens to some characters in our next play, A Midsummer Night's Dream. We will now transport you to the play's fairy world, a magical forest inhabited by supernatural creatures and ruled by King Oberon and Queen Titania. These two, like many human couples, are not on the best of terms. On a midsummer night, the mischievous Puck pours a magic liquid on Titania's eyes as she sleeps. 
So she will fall in love with the first creature she sees when she wakes up. The nimble pack also puts a Nassi's head on Bottom the Weaver, who however does not know about this, but sings away casually among his fellow players. Watch what happens when Titania wakes up. Their knavery. This is to make an ass of me, to frighten me, if they could. But I will not stir from this place. Do what they can. I walk up and down here and sing that they shall hear I'm not afraid. The whistle cocks of a lack of you with the red stony bill. The thrustle with his not so true. The ram with little quill. The fate that's barren when the light of place me from my flower is not full many a man doth mark and there's no other name. For, indeed, who would set his wit to so foolish a bed? Who would give a bed the lie, though she cried cuckoo, never so? I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. My ears are to know me of thy note. So is my eye fair to thy shape. And I fear that to scales the force doth move me. And the first you to say, to swear, I love thee. <laughs> Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. And yet, to say the truth, Reason and love keep little company together nowadays. <laughs> the more the pity that some honest neighbors will not make them friends. <laughs> Nay, I can click upon occasion. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. <laughs> not so neither. But if I had wit enough to get out of this wood, I have enough to serve my own turn. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here, whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rate. The summer still doth bend upon my sin. I do love thee, therefore go with me. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee, and they shall fetch you jewels from the deep, and sing while thou on press flowers dost sleep. And I will purge thy mortal closeness so, that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peace blossom, cobweb, moth and master seed. <laughs> And now from a dream world and its ridiculous love games, we will move to a real place, the city of Verona, and to a tale of true love, the saddest our world has ever known. For never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. It all starts at a ball in the house of Juliet's parents, where the young men of Verona have come to meet beautiful aristocratic girls. Romeo. The son of an enemy family has not been invited, but he and his friends sneak in as masked dancers. Romeo's intention is to glimpse at his disdain for Rosaline, but his eyes fall on Juliet instead, and hers on him. You're about to witness their very first meeting. Notice, please, that he doesn't know that she's a Capulet, nor she that he's a Montague. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle scene is this. My lips, to blessing pilgrims, ready stand, smooth at rough touch, with a tender kiss. Good pilgrim, you do wrong the hand too much, which manly devotion shows in this. For saints have hands, but pilgrims' hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. Have not saints' lips, and holy palmer's too. I pilgrim, lips that they must use in prayer. Oh then, dear saint, let lips do what hands do. They pray, grant thou, lest faith turn to despair. Saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. Then move not, while my prayer's effect I take. Thus, from my lips, by thine, my sin is purged. Then have my lips the sin that I Sin from thy lips, O oh, trespass sweetly urged, give me my sin again. Away with you, anon, good nurse. What is your mother? Mary Butler. Her mother is the lady of the house, and a good lady, and wise, and virtuous. I nurse her daughter that she talked with all. I tell you, he that can lay hold of her shall have the chains. Is she a capulet? 
Oh dear account, my life is my foe's debt. What's he that follows there that would not dance? If he be married, my grave is like to be my wedding bed. His name is Romeo and Timothy, the only son of your great enemy. My only love sprung from my only hate. Too early she not known, and known too late. Shakespeare's theater, I used to be Rosalind, who changed to Ganymede, and then back to Rosalind in the comedy as we like it. It was a sneaky pleasure back then to imagine the boys underneath the women's clothes. Now I am Ganymede, played by a woman, because times have changed. My gender is a confusing matter, so let it be. I am here to speak as the epilogue of our play. Of course, it is not the fashion to see the lady the epilogue, but it is no more unhandsome than to see the Lord the prologue. My way to the applause is, well, I am not fairest like a beggar, therefore to beg will not become me. My way is the contrary, and I'll begin with the women. I charge you, O oh women, for the love you bear to men, to like as much of our play as it please you. And I charge you, O oh men, for the love you bear to women, as I perceive by your simpering none of you hates them, that between you and the women are plenty of beats. If I were a woman, which I'm obviously not, I would kiss as many of you as had beards that pleased me, complexions that liked me, and breaths that I defied not. And I am sure, for those of you with good beards or good faces or sweet breaths, will, for my kind offer, when I make curtsy, bid me farewell.